recorder and so around from here and then I'm really going to be backward and I'm going to record over here in case So we're trying to record this uh, this important interview uh, three different ways. So this Veterans History Project interview is being uh, conducted on uh, Thursday, December the 3rd uh, in the year 2015 here at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is uh, Neil O'Shea. I'm a reference librarian. I'm privileged to work as the Veterans History Project uh, coordinator here at the library. and uh, I have the great honor today of speaking with Mr. Ray Marchetta. Uh, Mr. Marchetta uh, was born on the 22nd of May 1922 in, uh, in Chicago, and he now lives in Glenview, nearby Glenview. And uh, Mr. Marchetta learned of the Veterans History Project um, through his daughter, Laura, who is um, does great volunteer work for the honor flight uh, honor flights to Washington, and 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 Ray here has a, a copy of his hat from the honor flight that went to uh, Chicago, and um, uh, Laura obviously must have been uh, inspired by the by her family's history and her father's achievements during the war, so Ray has kindly consented consented to be interviewed for the project here today, and. Uh, this is his story. So, Ray, uh, you were born in Chicago, and you, uh, I wonder what year you might have entered the service. I went in in 1942. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was December the 10th. Coming up. Uh, coming up, my anniversary. Yeah, yeah, it might be 73 years, maybe. 93. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, were you drafted, or...? Well, I tried to enlist. I wanted to go into the Air Corps, and I was a half an inch too short. They flunked me out. So I figured, well, the heck with that noise then. I'll wait for them to draft me, which is what I did. What, um, how tall do you have to be at that time? You have to be 5'4", and I was 5 foot 3 and a half inches tall. Was there a particular reason why you thought the, the Air Corps might be? Oh, it was the glory and the glamour. Uh, so many of our, the fellows I went to school with uh, became members of, uh, they volunteered, they went and fought for, for England prior to us getting into the war. Wow. Some of our fellows did, fellows from Roosevelt High School. And uh, then when we got into the war, why it was a different story, why everybody was going to be drafted. And, Made twenty one dollars a month, twenty one dollars a day once a month. So you mentioned, uh, I think you might have mentioned uh, high school. What high school did you attend? I went to Roosevelt High School, that was on Kimball and Wilson in Chicago. Yeah, the Rough Riders. Rough Riders, go Rough Riders, go. Down the street from uh, Von Steuben. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, so you graduated from high school in. Uh, in 1941. In 41. So then you you had a year before you went into the yeah a little less than a little less year. than a year. Um, so d when you graduated from high school, were, did, did you were you working or uh, I was working for for Stuart Warner Alamite at that time frame, uh, and as a matter of fact, we were building parts for torpedoes. And uh, that's one of the things that I often think back about. Uh, we were really preparing in some manner, shape, or form because the parts of the torpedo that we made, we were making prior to us going to war with Japan. Interesting. So were any of the people working at that company, would they have gotten a deferment because they were making Yes, yeah. I did get a deferment for six months. But you wouldn't go be it wouldn't go beyond that. No, that was it. Then that I had it. to go on the service. Then you had to go on the service. So, having been turned down for the Army Air Corps, then you were drafted into. I the waited U until they drafted. You were drafted into the U.S. Army. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then, um, do you know where you were inducted? Or I was inducted at uh, right in Chicago Loop, and then we went from there to Fort Sheridan. 
Did you go up on the train or something? On the train, exactly. Yeah. The L train, it was kind of an L train type of thing. Yeah. That ran up to Fort Sheridan. And then, uh, what were your first days like in the Army? Did you enjoy it or it was oh, a great first, adventure? Well, having been inducted into the Army, when I finally did go in, uh, we were given a 10 day leave after being inducted in. That was on the 21st. So I had a pass to go home for Christmas. And I was on the last shipping orders to go down to Little Rock, Arkansas. So I did not go home for Christmas, which was rather disappointing. And uh, the general in charge of this was at uh, Camp Joseph D. Robinson in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he allowed us to go to town on liberty, even though we didn't know our military orders and what have you. I says, salute all officers and do the best you can, but you guys can go to town uh, tonight. So was your, was your um, basic training, was that in, um, at Fort Sheridan or was that down in oh, that Camp? Was in Little Rock, Arkansas. That was in Little Rock, Arkansas. Joseph T. Robinson. Yeah. Was that the first time in your life that you were away from home for a length yes, of time? Yes, sir. So that must have been kind of interesting. It was. It was a big change. And then the Army is accepting these people from all over the country, different walks of life, and yeah. they're all, you're all meeting new people and learning how to work together. It must have been quite an experience. It was. It was totally different from anything we had done uh, in the past. Uh, a couple of my buddies were already in the Navy, and one also went into the Marine Corps by the time I was drafted. So, um, so you complete the uh, basic training in, in Arkansas. Little Rock, Arkansas. And then they assign you to a company or a... No, then we, the, they had, uh, they were trying to do an outfit like MASH. It was a 222nd station hospital. And that's uh, the organization I went to. And I was attached to the pharmacy. I was one of three men that were attached. We had a, a pharmacist from Civilian Life, and he was uh, a, he passed the bar. You know, we were we were learning as we went along, and uh, so then we were mixing prescriptions and doing everything we should do. Once we got to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, we went after basic training. We went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Was there any particular reason, do you think, why they put you in pharmacy? Did you take a test? Did you have, you did really well in high school biology no, or something? We, no, they were looking for an outfit. Uh, the organization I was with, they always had female nurses. And this organization they put together with male nurses in place of female nurses. And they took guys with the top IQs as they came along. So we were a very intelligent group. So the test you took, you must. You, so you I scored pretty well on the IQ test. Yeah, and that's why it was put in. And then we were told at that time frame, if we didn't make our our status, you know, that they wanted us to achieve, why uh, we would be bedpan commandos. In other words, we'd be orderlies. So we studied and we learned everything that we had to do. Very quickly, I assure you. Um, and you didn't find it hard to master the material or to... No, no, no. It can be, when you're young, you can do anything. Um, were there any drill instructors who were difficult to work with or mean-spirited or maladjusted? No, or, we, no, we all went in and we served our time basic training. And then from there, we went into... Uh, as I say, the 222nd Station Hospital, which they were putting together. And that's the organization I was with all through my Army career. So you must have, when, you, when you're in the 222nd and then you're in South Carolina, you must be thinking about, are we going overseas and which way are we going, you know? Yeah, we went from, from Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to A.P. Hill, Virginia, which was a staging area. So we knew we were going overseas. But you didn't know? We didn't know where we were going, which way, uh, and we were given a one-week furlough at that time frame, which we were able to go home on the train, and the airplanes weren't that, that available at that time frame. 
So we all took the train to our various spots and we had to be back there. And then after our staging at uh, AP Hill, why uh, we made a trip out to California and we shipped over on New Year's Eve of 43 and we went to, uh, we went first, our first stop, I can't even, the, the Marcus Islands uh, is the first stop that we were in. And there we saw a, a Liberty ship that had a hole blown in it the size of that pane of glass there. Wow. Uh, from a Japanese submarine. And we were traveling without an escort. We were an Army troop uh, transport. Did you sail from San Francisco? Or? We sailed from San Francisco, yeah. yeah. And did, um, did you have, do you think your, the, the, your group had a preference of going to Europe or going to the Pacific? No, we just went where they told us. Just went where they told us. <laughs> we weren't certain where we were going. We had no idea. So you were probably on, on the ocean longer than you would have been if you'd have been making the trip to Europe, you're, I imagine, the, oh, yeah. across oh, the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we went to uh, the Marcus Island first was our first stop. And like I say, there, there was a Jap sub that went out every morning trying to pick up the sub that was uh, giving them a lot of grief. Uh, we were a uh, men from the Merchant Marine manned the ship. We had Navy men of war who manned the guns hauling army transportation, army troops. And I was a member of the band. I had my accordion with me, and I was part of ship's band then. I've got a, a thing in here that says we were So did, did, did you, did you, were you able to keep your accordion with you I all the time? Yes. And the army didn't mind? No, we, well, there were times when we didn't have it with us. Our stuff was put in storage and it would catch up to us. Well, you must have, that would, must have been a great uh, morale booster. Oh, yeah, that's, I, the I, sent, things. I sent my accordion home. I didn't want it to get ruined. And I had a colonel by the name of Colonel Curry. And he says, Marchetta, he says, you're the biggest morale booster we've got. He says, uh, why don't you send home for your accordion? And if it gets ruined or something like that, we will replace it. But no one knew how long we were going to be or where we were going to go. And in event, in eventually, uh, Colonel Curry was killed. Uh, went with another group, and and he was looking to make full colonel, and he was a uh, silver leaf colonel, you know. And uh, he was killed, and so we parted ways, you know. But I never did get an accordion. But my accordion did go to go to Hades, because uh, you know it was so damp over there, everything. Uh, your leather shoes would get mildew. Yeah. And what make was the accordion? Do you recall? It was a Del Principe made here in Chicago by the Del Principe. Or, and as a matter of fact, I paid three hundred and eighteen dollars for that accordion. That was must have been a beautiful instrument. Well, it was great, you know, and uh, but it took a lot of abuse. Yeah. We had a great time with it, and then being with a hospital group, uh, I used to go to ward, to ward, to ward, and play. Uh, sing-alongs every night of the week. You know, we so, have that. So you're, uh, you're 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 playing the accordion. Probably did as much good as some of the as some of the pills you passed out as oh, a pharmacist, yeah. right? Yeah. I have I have articles in here about everybody enjoying my playing. You oh, know. I look forward they to were, trying to scan those for the uh, yeah, for the interview I'll give booklet. You a, yeah. That's How did you come to, was there a tradition of um, mu musical in your family, were there musicians? Or? I wanted to play the accordion extremely bad, and at that time, this was Depression days. Yeah. And I couldn't afford an accordion, and I started working in a grocery store when I was 13 years old. And when I finally got enough, I, I bought a guitar prior to getting the accordion, and I played the Hawaiian guitar for a while. And I was a boy soprano, so there was a lady by the name of Sophie Allback, and they owned a bakery in Chicago. And I was being a boy soprano. If I sang with her choral group, she would give me free piano lessons. So that's how I learned how to play. You know, wow. Quite an interesting story It is, to me. yeah. So you, you must have musical aptitude. I did. I played by ear. I, didn't, I don't read music. 
but I can play with anybody. You know, you need come a few bars and I'll play along. So it was a lot of fun. And, you know, you'd learn all the songs that, uh, you know, that everyone knew, The Man on the Flying Trapeze and uh, Pistol Pack and Mama and, uh, oh, we did parodies to almost everything. And when we were in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which was close to A.P. Hill, uh, I produced a show at the USO. And I've, there's some mention of that in some of these notes that I've got back. Here. So at a different age of time, you might have gone into musical theater. I could have, yeah. probably, but uh, I've done all these different things, you know. So the, the, the 222nd Station Hospital, then, you're, you're moving around the, the Pacific we from went, island to island in we support of the... From Benica and the Russells uh, to Pavuvu. And the 1st Marine Division was over at Pavuvu. And that's when Bob Hope came over and we backed up Bob Hope's show. And uh, Bob left Benica and he flew over because the 1st Marine Division was at, was at uh, Pavuvu. And then the 1st Marine Division on their next invasion was uh, Peleliu. And we, they lost 70% killed in action in that skirmish, you know. So these were not happy days, you know. That, but Bob Hope went over there and he did the show. We did not go with him. So when you, when you're on the 222nd, do you, is the hospital on the ship or do you set up a hospital? No, we, set up, we, on, built a, on, we built our own hospital on the land. It's like putting a tinker toy. Uh, they were all panels and you put them all together. And my job at that time frame during the day was climbing coconut trees and pulling them down and making space for the for the wards and the barracks and things of this nature. Pulling down the coconut trees. Yeah, I, I had a five-ton dump trick that I had a winch on the front end of, and I used to take a cable and a chain, and I had climbers, and I've got pictures of that in here, where I'd climb up the tree and fasten it around the tree, and I'd go back into the truck and have the winch, and if the winch would pull them right over. And if you put, had it too high, it would snap the tree off about six foot too high. If you put it too low, you'd break the, there was a, a pin in the, uh, in the winch that would snap. So you watch what you did. I, could, I got to a point where I could take them right off, almost level with the ground. And we built, I took all of those, uh, all of the coconut, you know, the, the uh, main parts of the tree, and we built a theater called the 222nd, the Three Deuces Theater. And I've got pictures of that here. And that would have been on That would have been Washington. on Benica. Uh, that was on Benica, on the first Benica, one in the Russell, yeah. I Russell Islands, yeah. yeah. And the Russells are part of the Solomons. I don't know if you were aware yeah. of that. No. Yeah. The, um, so, uh, how was the food? How was the food? Did you, you know, not so bad? We had K rations, we had C rations, and geez, if you, I never smoked until I went in the service. I, when I was 20 years old, I started to smoke. And I smoked 20 till I was 31, and I quit it after that. But did uh, did you have some kind of a ceremony when you went across the equator or anything? Yes, like we that? did. I've got a copy of that here. We became shellbacks, and I also became. There's another name for it when you fly over it. I've done both, because when we left, when we left Guadalcanal, they wanted to get us up to Kwajalein in a hurry, so they flew us up there. So we actually flew to to across the equator the second time. The first time we went as uh, by ship, you know, with the ceremony and everything, you know. Did, um, was it difficult to stay in touch with your family back in Chicago? Were they worried about you? Oh yeah, well, we received mail a lot of times, you know, and sometimes we didn't get mail, but uh, it was nice. And whenever my mom could, she'd send me a little box of goodies, and and I loved peanut brittle, and that usually got over, got they're in pretty good shape. And you'd share it with every one of your buddies, you know. Yeah. 
So you mentioned that you didn't really smoke until you were in the army then, yeah, right? Did true. you get beer rations too? Or no? Yeah, beer was rationed once in a while. If there'd be a liberty that came in, uh, you'd be able to get you'd be able to get your ration of beer. I didn't like beer, so I usually gave, gave them to my buddies. You know, I was never a beer drinker. Um, when you when you played at any of the did you play in officers' clubs too? Oh sure, yeah. So did you the get? Did, did, was it was it some of the guys able to get a drink more? Drink I was a manager of the officers' club on Panique and the Russells. No, which was a completely sealed off area. So any time I wanted booze, I could get booze from from yeah. the officer. And every now and then I get enough to share with some of my buddies. Yeah. But you know when we were when we were stationed in A.P. Hill, Virginia. Uh, you could get uh, the officers got, or the people that were old enough. I was only 20 years old at that time frame, so I couldn't get a ration book. But we used to take an ambulance and pretend that we took people that were wounded or something or hurt and take them to Walter Reed Hospital. We'd go up there and we'd buy liquor and we'd bring it back with an ambulance. With the with the sirens going in the whole nine yards, so we 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 were Dickens, you know. You see that the stunts that they pulled on on Mash, we made them look very silly. We done <laughs> the same thing long before they did. And we had a lot of fun doing it, you know. Yeah. Um, was there any time when you thought that uh, your unit was um, under severe attack or? You really no, felt we, endangered, or we had some sniper action, we had some air raids, but we were ne never in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it's amazing, you know. We uh, but the air raid, air raid sirens must be kind of scary. Oh yeah, yeah. they. Yeah. Had, uh, well, we we had a two-story when we were on Kwajalein, we had two-story barracks, and you would dive out your if you were up on the second floor, you'd go up. You had a foxhole right alongside of it. Did your unit ever have to care for any prisoners of war, no. Japanese? Or we, well, I think we had some of them, but they kept them separate. Yeah, or any of the natives on the islands that might have been. We took care of the natives. Yeah, yeah. I've got pictures of some of the natives that we took care of. Yeah, the the pictures that you have, but were they pictures that you took yourself? Either me or one of the fellows in our outfit. So uh, they did. Film, film they, was very tough to come by. I bet. And they didn't mind. Uh, you taking pictures or uh, secret? They wouldn't wouldn't censor your taking photos or. Uh, oh no! I couldn't take any. I couldn't send any of these home. Yeah. That we were totally under censorship. I've got a. We had a party one night where all the officers filled the shoes of the enlisted men, and the enlisted men had a party that night. So the captains and. And first lieutenant, second lieutenant, they all took our places for that night that we'd get one night of, we were off that night, you know. Yeah. This picture here shows me up a tree. Oh, this is when you're taking down the... Yeah, when I was taking down winching, trees. Yeah, winching down yeah, the winching coconuts. Winching down trees. Yeah. Where I was climbing up it. So I got so many different... But that's a hospital that we built, you know. At, was this on Benica? That's on Benica in the Russell Island. Yeah. Yes. In this picture here, it's Ray, Terry, and a native. Is that on? Yeah, that's a native that was uh, Terry was one of the fellows that was in our outfit. And that was one of the natives. They had them. They used them as office orderlies sometime. Uh, well, all these different. Um, you have written out here on the biographical data form, Benique in the Russell Islands, Guadalcanal in the Solomons, Kwajalein in the Marshall. Uh, this is a picture of the 222nd Station Hospital Theater. Oh, the you see all the logs? All those logs are, are trees that I pulled down. That would be coconut wood, wouldn't coconut it? Coconut wood, yes. Yeah. Sir. And then, and this was on Benica, was it? It's on Benica. So you went Benica for the longest? That was Long, the longest. Yeah, time? My longest stint was Benica. Probably a year or uh, uh, close to a year. Yeah. Yeah. I had malaria while I was on Guadalcanal on my 21st birthday. I was in a hospital with malaria. 
I did you have a memory then. Yeah, you did you 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 caught that from a mosquito then or yeah, mosquitoes, yeah. So even though you they must And I was feeling fine. The day before I was feeling fine and one of the fellows I worked in the lab and the pharmacy both. And so this one guy I thought he was kidding me. His name was Matthew Bone, B O H N and he said, Marchetta, you got malaria and I says you're full of condensed garbage. Yeah. And uh, he says, come on in and do your own slide, because I was able to do I had enough knowledge to do this, so all you do is prick your finger, get a drop of blood, put it on a slide, and then we had to process the slide. And sure as heck, I had malaria. But I didn't believe him. But that next day, my temperature was running very high. I was laying on a wooden cot. And I think the cot was bouncing on the dirt floor, on the dirt ground, you know. Yeah. So in those days, did they have malaria vac vaccination for malaria? No. No. Well, you took quinine and adabrin. But uh, the thing was is that I never thought I had it. You know, I would have swore I didn't have it. I was feeling fine. So that, that knocked you out of commission for a week or so, or a couple of weeks? Yeah, well, I went. I went on light duty with an engineering outfit. And a light duty was running a 30-pound jackhammer. <laughs> so, I think some of the veterans have said you could get a relapse with malaria, right? Oh, so I had it six times. I had it three times overseas, uh, or four times overseas, I had it twice after I came home. I had it once after I was married. Wow. Which was two years later, you know. Yeah. But all those pictures came from different different spots. And know? this would have been a hospital that you built. That yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, we we were pretty capable guys, you know. Yeah. We built a boat, like I say, we built a boat. There, there was a freshwater. This is a freshwater lake on Bonica. And here's a pretty girl on a farm. Well, no, that that was one of the girls back home, Mark Sullivan. And we used to write. Uh, that was Marge. That was my buddy's girlfriend, not my girlfriend, but she was, she wrote to us all the time religiously. She wrote some of the nicest letters of all. Yeah. And like I say, she's gone too. It, it's amazing that you know, all these people. I got pictures of the the. Uh, oh. Of the cemeteries on Guadalcanal and on Vidika both. Yeah, let, Ray. Let me ask. Um, sure. There was never any doubt in your among the men that you served with that the, the U.S. That the United States was going to win the war, right? We were going to win. You yeah. knew it. You just well, felt it. You knew it. Our outfit was slated for going to Okinawa for staging. We were slated to go in on the invasion of Japan. We would have lost men, power. You know, they were yeah. well, the Japanese were well fortified. Operation Coronet, they reckon there would have been a million casualties, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, so when you heard the news that the... Oh, we, when we heard that the war was over, we were, we praised President Truman <laughs> to the highest level, believe me, you know. Uh, it, it's amazing how all the different things that you think back about. I just jotting through this book myself, and I saw Ed Clark sitting here. This is at uh, our our pharmacy, and this is Carol Landis here. I remember. I you remember yeah, that name. Yeah. So she was coming out to, for a USO show. Yeah, she was killed in an airplane crash. Carol Landis. Yeah, she and Miller, you know, Glenn Miller were casualties. Yeah. Casualties of the war. Yeah. But well, Glenn Miller died in Europe, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. In Europe, he yeah. Did. That's why I say, as I glance at these things, uh, all the different guys and yeah, and they all suggest. Uh, now this this was the this was uh, a quarters that we had built for any of the entertainers that came over. You know that that's all screened in and everything. So that would have been on. Uh, that's on Benico also. That's also on Benico. Yeah. So you had some famous entertainers that came through there. Oh yeah, we had. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of uh, Larry Adler that played the harmonica. This guy could play Bach, Beethoven, or Boogie. 
I mean, he was just unreal. We backed up his show too. He was really a tremendous entertainer. You know, I had I had the best of two worlds because I got to play along with these people, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. I was so I was so thankful that I did take my accordion with. Because I was good for morale. Yeah. Not only the manpower, but mine also. Yeah. Because you enjoy playing music I and having it appreciated. And then, yeah. uh, so Colonel Curry was kind of a hero then. Oh yeah, he he, he was he was high on my list. That's too for, unfortunate. Yeah. He got killed. You know. He left our organization for a while, and but you know the accordion gave me different advantages. You know. I'm kind of glancing through some of these pictures, okay? As a matter of fact... But you know, uh, Ray, if I could just say here, um, I'm asking you about, I asked you whether you were ever worried or you felt threatened or something, right? But it, but you did take some shrapnel at one time, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, I did take a little shrapnel in my... Just a little. A yeah. real tiny amount. I, I never... Knew it, probably. Oh, it, that's been in the role of my life from Army days on. And what island was that? air raid. That was an air raid on. Uh, that was on Kwajalein. Kwajalein, yeah. Yeah. We used to call these air raids uh, washing machine or just called Charlie's. <laughs> you know, wake you up in the middle of the night, you know. Yeah. Were they uh, those Japanese bombers, Betty's or something? I can't remember. Yeah. But I, you know, I even went up with the VMB 214 was a Marine bomber squadron, and while we were on quad and didn't have nothing to do at night, well, I'd take a ride with them because they had islands that the Japanese were still holding, and we'd leave them build so much of a runway up as soon as they got enough, well, we'd go in and we'd bomb it, and you know, and they only had they only had. 25 caliber machine guns, you know, at that time frame. One time, uh, there was a Jap sub that undoubtedly left them off with an ACAC gun, you know, and there were two guys, uh, Blackie was one and his brother, one of the brothers was killed because we didn't know that they had stronger, the, the stronger, higher caliber, uh, or something. higher caliber, and, but one of them was shot down and killed. So sometimes at night, just just to, to change your pace, you'd go up on these marine. I'd go on these flights. Yeah, it was it was safe. We'd go in there and we. Your your commanding officer wouldn't have minded or anything. Oh no, no, well maybe he would have. But yeah. I, I, I never asked, and I proceeded to do so. So um, being in a hospital unit, you you looked after marines too. Then. Oh sure. So you had yeah, you got along with all the armed yeah, forces. Sure. Yeah. We were very fortunate. Uh, as a matter of fact, one day, this is a story off off what happened. Uh, there was a commanding officer from Knob Pier and others. He's the guy that, when the ships come in, and my one buddy, Ernie, I knew that he was on the USS Prince William, which was a Jeep carrier, you know, a small carrier. And uh, they were coming into Kwajalein. And we were already, the war was now over, and we were waiting, we had enough points to go home. But uh, we, I had gone out to Knob Pier, and I asked this, this uh, the commander of, of Knob Pier, I said, he could pick me up with the right Sure, he says, come on out this afternoon when he get in, we'll take you out there. I got back, when I got back to my outfit with a Jeep, I found out that we're going out on the USS Prince William. I played the accordion on the Prince William coming home. But we went from Kwajalein to Pearl Harbor. And so that, that's that. And guess who was on that ship? My buddy was on the ship. If we tried to work that out, we never could have. Was your buddy from Chicago? Yeah, he was. We, were, we, we both went to high school together, early on. We couldn't arrange that. Uh, I was just very lucky. Yeah, he was Army also. No, he was he was uh, Navy on on board. But you all came, Prince William. But y'all came home. Oh, he was. Yeah. All five of us came home without with all of our pieces. Yeah. And I mean that's amazing. So that would have been in 40, 40, and 40, 40. 42 to forty six actually. So you came home. I was only in the Army three years. Just over two years of it was overseas. Yeah. 
So would you um, would you consider making a career in the army? No, I wanted out. I wanted out. As a matter of fact, I thought I was going to be a, become a pharmacist outside, and uh, so I went down to the Illinois. You know, they have a school of college pharmacy, pharmacy or something, here. Yeah. yeah, downtown Chicago. And the dean was going to waive two years of my college education. I'd only have to go two years rather than four and then take my bar. And prior to coming in, he passed away. So I, the other, the new dean would not give me credit for the two years. So I was really down about that. So, and that was right after I got home, you know. So consequently, uh, that I went back into, into I, I was a construction worker. I was a carpenter for 65 years with the local 58. So, um, with your high IQ, um, you wouldn't have considered using the GI Bill or something like that. I did for a while. I went to uh, I went back to school at Chicago Tech uh, for two years, and I got a a, what a junior associate diploma, degree, yeah. associate degree, and I did do that. And I was a I was a superintendent for 38 years with the same company, short term employment. <laughs> so um, this um, when you're um, so you didn't have a hard time then finding a job after the war? No, no, no. I went back to Stuart Warner for a while, but I was making as much as my boss was, and he, I couldn't get a raise then. Well, then I, my argument was, well, they should give him a raise along with me. But they wouldn't do that. They had, so I said, well, then I decided I was going to go in and I... Did you, um, did you live at home when you came home? Yes, sir. Yeah. And then... Uh, Until I got married. How long after did you get home and be married? I got married uh, when I was 24 years old, 20, going in, going to be 25. Was there? Did you and your wife have any difficulty find, finding housing after the war? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, I had to clean the the stairway on a three-story building to get the the apartment in there. And I agreed to do so. Yeah, I've, I've heard stories. Yeah, yeah, that's how I got my apartment. Yeah, did you had you known your wife before you went into the army? Just, uh, just not. Uh, we worked together. We both worked at Stuart Moore. Oh, you met her there. But I had met her. She was part of the Lawndales, you know, in Chicago, and excellent dancer. She was in. She was a dancing instructor at. Uh, and I'll put like, uh, what's the fellow with, that does all the dance? Arthur Murray? Arthur Murray taught me dancing in a hurry. Well, she worked for another studio that was competition to them. She was an excellent dancer. Did she ever see you in, a, in your uniform? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to skate five nights a week. I was a guard at Riverview Roller Rink before going into the service. And I taught waltz and fox shot, so I wasn't a lame guy on. Yes, yeah, so you, you could know, you could play the music and I, dance. I, it. I do well dancing. I was an outstanding skater, an outstanding water skier, and snowmobiler. You name it, I've had my fun in life. Yeah, I'm a very fortunate man. Yeah, you're uh, physically and intellectually. I have a good yeah. outlook on life. Yeah. I, I hesitate uh, at times because I can't remember, but. Uh, I'm better than the average bear in the same degree. Yeah. Um, was, your, was your family, you enjoyed good health too? You inherited good genes? No, or? my mother had a bad heart. My mom died when she was 72. My father died when he was 94. My father was a paper cutter. By, he ran the bindery for the Franklin Company downtown. So your, your last name, Marchetta, is yes, Italian. Sir. Yes, sir. Was, uh, my mother was German. That's a great combination. <laughs> so when did that, uh, and then your your parents, they were both born in... in the yeah, my dad was born here. No, my mother came over when she was three months old. Uh -huh. But my dad was born at Taylor and Racine in Chicago. That's like the old neighborhood. Kind exactly. Of. My dad's father brought over bonded paper. You know what bonded paper is? 
Years gone by, all your legal stationery was bonded paper. Well, my dad's dad brought that process over here. They were very wealthy at one time. With the Italians, though, they, they had a way that uh, it didn't go to the next of kin within the family. It all goes back to the partner. That's the way it went. So we got nothing, and then later on... So then you moved from the west side, and then you moved... No, we were always, always in Albany Park on the northwest side of Chicago. That's where I lived. Yeah. I spent all of my life, I was born in the house, my dad bought a home prior to him marrying my mother. Ah. He was pretty wealthy and he was able to do so. 4307 North St. Louis Avenue for a long, long time. Um, Ray, um, you came out as a staff sergeant. Yes, sir. How, do, you do you recall when you got your promotions or... Oh, I was a corporal for a long, long time, and we had a major with our office by the name of Major Grisk, and he wouldn't pass out our our uh, our promotions. He was tight with them, you know, and so finally, when he left our organization, I, I got I jumped two grades within two months' time because everybody knew me and they knew I was worth the stripes, you know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you were good at getting along with people, but you, oh, must, I got along well. but you must have been a good supervisor, too. Oh, yes. I good was, manager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As your success in yeah. later life later attest to. Later, yeah. no matter what I did. Yeah. And then you received a good conduct medal, and then the um, battle star for Guadalcanal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you, after the war, did you were you able to stay in contact with your wartime buddies? A couple of them, couple. Bill Brust and Vinnie Garino. I went out to New York. They came here, and then we just drifted apart. And uh, Bill was working for Tiffany's in New York, and he married his wife. And then we even had a reunion in New York. So we flew out for the reunion. We had a great time. Did you? Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Or? Well, yeah, I'm a veteran of VFW. VFW. Yeah, the, the Skokie Post. Skokie Post. Yeah. Um, was the, did the 220, the 222nd or the, the good old three deuces, did they ever have any, any, any reunions or? Yeah, they had one. We had the one up in New York and uh, that was right after we were married and my wife and I, we both went to it. So um, I sense that we're coming to the end of the of the interview, oh, okay. um, um, and there's always two questions that we, that we sure. ask. That suggest number one is, um, how do you think your service in the military and those experiences affected your life? I think they were beneficial, if I face it realistically. I didn't like some of it, uh, but you know we were fed a certain amount of propaganda and the propaganda we received was that this is the war to end all wars and that's what we thought we were fighting the war to end wars and uh, it didn't turn out that way we've been in more conflicts since then yeah but it was uh, an amazing this performance to fight on two fronts yeah, yeah. But you figure we lost more people in the Civil War than we did in World War II. And, you know, flying out, to, it was a great time for me to go to Honor Flight Chicago. Uh, when we first uh, were going to go uh, to Washington, D.C., and I told my wife, you know, because the VFW said, hey, you guys are are able to do this, and my wife said no. She says, I want to go also, and you could, it was a lo you were a loner if you took Honor Flight Chicago. So I did. Uh, she was in a wheelchair at that time frame, uh, and I took her to Washington, and we toured all of the, all the memorials, and I brought her back. And then when she was in a nursing home over here, in, close at hand, right down Waukegan Road. She was at Bethany oh, yes. for we three had a, years. We had a veteran in Bethany, yeah. 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 And uh, so consequently, uh, we 
school. I forgot the trend of thought that I was making the honor flight uh, by yourself. The honor flight by myself. Why uh, her roommate? He was uh, was one of the fellows that had gone to it. He says, Ray, it's totally different. Go and do it. And I did, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And that was the first time I never talked about my service days in service prior to. Yeah. What year was that that you went? Uh, in 2012. Yeah, you you just mentioned October something interesting that you didn't. After you went on the honor flight, you talked more about. Uh, I talked. I was telling my kids what went on. I never talked to anybody about what went on in service. Because the. Um, the Library of Congress would like its cooperating partners, like the libraries, to get um, interviews with Vietnam veterans. Uh -huh. But the Vietnam veterans, they, they don't want to talk, about, want to talk it. about it. Yeah, but your daughter, yeah. Laura, says yeah. that she thinks once they make their honor flights yeah. and they come home, it's going to be a different. They may be talk. Different. Yes. It'll be different. Yeah. yeah, it made you proud of what you did. And we didn't, when we came home, just a, just a flock of guys coming home, and that was it. We all came home. And we were happy to be home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The day of my getting my discharge from the earth, from the army, my one buddy came to uh, Camp Grant to pick me up. And uh, Is that out in Rockford. Or yeah, yeah, right close yeah. to Rockford. Yeah, yeah that it's not there any longer, but. But Camp Grant is where I was discharged from, and so Lenny borrowed his dad's car and came down and picked me up and drove me home. My my family did not. Lenny did. My buddy. That's remarkable. And then the um, the second question is: um, Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes. Yeah. I I resent. Some of the things <laughs> I shouldn't get on my soapbox now, but uh, we were always very proud of what we did, even though we didn't talk about it. Uh, I think that some of the things that we, our president has done sometime were was belittling to our country, and I'm kind of a diehard on that because uh, our country is the greatest country in the world. And I'll run the flag up for it as high as I can. Uh, this is life and it goes on. But I, we become disillusioned by some of the things that our current president has done. Yeah. And I rest my case there. I don't want to get on that too much. Yeah. But uh, I know you, we, uh, you say the Pledge of Allegiance with the veterans yes. at the breakfast. And that last line with liberty and justice for all, oh, that's big. That's powerful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you know, when they say, well, now we can't do this, they can't pray in, in schools, and they can't do this, they can't do that. And that's not right. That's not what our country was founded on. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm that, I've become very bitter about uh, that. Uh, but that's just my outlook, and you know I just feel that uh, I won't say what I really think. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> what can I tell you? Yeah. No, I appreciate your uh, your candor and sharing that. Um, and um, Ray, is there anything that we you would like to add that we haven't covered in the interview? Um, some I memories that are prompted by a picture or two? Or like I say, this is a cemetery at Guadalcanal. The natives built this chapel. I don't know if you've heard any of that. No. Uh, and you look both ways. Down here, you see all these white crosses. Every one of them is one of our guys, you know. And then when I... Uh, you know, this is the right side of the chapel and left side of the chapel, and these crosses stretch out as far as you can see, Mike. Wow. So we lost a lot of men there. Yeah. Uh, this is my buddy Vinny Garino right out in front. The natives wove all of these fronts of these buildings and everything. Out of palm from uh, Palms, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what this is, yeah. If you could. They really make the most of their environment. Oh, yeah. these guys, uh, it's uncanny. But that's, and then, like I say, this is looking each way. The pictures are not that great, 
But there's some more pictures there, and I had pictures of uh, of the cemetery at Benico also. It would look very similar. <laughs> I see Father Letcher was... Uh, Father Letcher was a Catholic chaplain. And the, the, the chaplains were important, I think. Oh, you better believe they were. I almost transferred. I was a Lutheran. I almost went Catholic at the time of that. I used to play cards with him. We used to play cards a lot. I don't like to play cards at all now. That's kind of a staged picture there, right? No mail today. Everybody, no mail today. Everybody today. looks sad. Yeah. Yeah. So why was there no mail on that day? The plane didn't well, come or the ship? Didn't get it. Just didn't get it. There were a lot of days like that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And there's another, Father Dooley. D-U-L-E-Y. Yeah. And Major Grissom. Major Grissom. He's the guy that didn't want to pass out the... Oh, he was kind of tight-fisted. He was tight-fisted with the... Yeah. And then a couple of these must have been some of the buddies that went to Europe, right? There's pictures in here from Belgium. Yeah, there's, that's my buddy, John. He, he repaired locomotive engines over there. Wow. Oh, remember Jack, well, Jack Carson, he's current. We've done Jack He was a comedian. Yeah, yeah, sure. I remember yeah. him. He must have been in Belgium here. then. And little to Martha Tilton. This gal here with Joan Brunner, she played the accordion. That's her right there. So I had a lot of fun with, uh, you know, with... As a matter of fact, right here, this page here, you said, did I ever become a shellback? Yeah. Uh, there's a shellback, and then the other one is a ship band. Those two passes on there. This is kind of, this has been through the war. Oh, this is holy. Yeah, this is, a, this is for the career. But there's pictures in there from, from all different. Yeah, there's another pretty girl here. It says Glamour. Yeah, well, that, those were, the early shots were, some of them were from the civilian gals, you know. Yeah. But that was me becoming a ship. Oh, yes, you were, a, a ship's band and you were a trusty shellback having crossed the equator aboard the SS President, President Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Attested to by the transport commander. Yeah. James Lynch, 6th of January, 1944, the special duty pass. Yeah. But there's pictures in their billboard boxes, you know. This is where we had we added on to Kwajalein. Kwajalein was not long enough. Kwajalein was an atoll, not an island. So we had to add on to the island, put a half, an, half a mile of more on the island to make it so that we could land B-29s there. And where did you get the, the dirt for that? Or the we scooped out the coral, ah. you know, and, and built it up. And then there's a picture of the theater. Yeah, the two, three deuces theaters in there. Yeah, I don't know, it just says theater, yeah. yeah. This would have been on Kwajalein, right? Yeah, the, no, that... That would have been on... These are at Kwajalein, yeah, 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 the other was at Benicia, yeah. yeah. Boy, look at all those... Uh, Potions and liquids and yeah, that well, we mixed everything from scratch. You didn't have all the pre-mixed medications that you had. Yeah, and that's a, there's a big plane. That, uh, that's a B-29. B-29. Yeah. Wow, that's when the 29 first came in. As a matter of fact, the Enola Gay was going to land at Kwajalein, and then they decided no, they took off from somewhere close to Okinawa. You know. Yeah. Mr. Vendrick. Yeah. The Navy takes over. Yeah, the Navy took over from us. They relieved us from duty. That's when we were... So that was, it was a Navy hospital unit then? Or no, no? We, we were Army, but they took ours over. We took over... Uh, there was a Navy and an Army hospital on Benica. We had both of them. 
But this is my buddy ship. That's USS uh, Prince, Prince William. William. Yeah. Prince William sounds like it could have been a. That's a that's, there's a there's a landing in in uh, Alaska. Prince William Sound. Yeah. That's what the ship is named. Named for the geographic sound. Yeah. Well, but originally, it was probably named for uh, an English. I, I yeah. don't know. But yeah. That's all the different. That Ernie yacht that you see out here. When I saw him sticking his head out, he didn't know I was on this island. He didn't know where I was, but I knew that he was aboard that ship because my mom had, you know, he came in on leave and she says, Ernie is on the USS Prince William, so I always watch for it any time. So when they came in the port, why, that was going to be really special for me. And this ship here with the uh, the guns. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's USS Prince William. But on the way back to the states, that was coming. We went to Hawaii on that, from Kwajalein to yeah to uh, to, to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii to the states, we were on the Marcus Island, which which was a Kaiser. That was an aluminum carrier, the small carrier that yeah. they were. I'm going to say, fortunately, th there wasn't much chance you'd have to use these guns on the way back at this point because the, war, no way, was, the yeah. war was over. Yeah. That's why we were all there, you know. Did you gain any weight or did you grow when you were in the Army? No, I, was, I came out 135 pounds. After I, this this will be Susan, things with uh, different, my sister getting married. Well, I was still in service at that time. Thing. It gives you an idea. Of, I, I oh, yeah. How long just it might be easier. No, it's uh, sometimes a picture's a worth picture a, picture a few words. You'd better believe it. <laughs> Anything else you. Okay. This is when we got out. We had a party in Hawaii on King Street. That was halfway between uh, Waikiki and. Uh, and Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, you know. And these are the gentlemen. They're we, uh, all guys from our outfit. You want to see what a pillbox looked like? Yeah. With, uh, see all the reinforcing in there. Those are like iron. All the steel reinforcing rods. rods. Yeah. All over the place. I mean, our Navy done a real job on Kwajalein because they laid offshore. With, with our we had uh, oh, warships at that time that just lobbed shells in and they blew the hell out of these things. You know there wasn't a tree taller than that anywhere on the island when Navy got done with it. So then they went in, we went in. That was easy campaign. I didn't get a star from for that because we got there two days after they you know they declared it. A safe area, and so this, I didn't get a this is a destroyed uh, Japanese pillbox here. That's right, yeah, yeah. that's a Japanese pillbox. So this, uh, yeah, I'd like to scan these also if I can. Yeah, sure. Yeah, these are the ones here. This is Island Command. That's what I'm saying. I worked at Island Command. This is Island Command after we, you know, after everything got sorted out. And we got notice that we were going to have to put a, a contingent of Marines around the clock on the Enola Gay. Nobody knew what the Enola Gay. We didn't know anything about what yeah. was going on. But I was working. I got the message on the teletype that night. And this is when you were on Guadalcanal? That, no, that was on Kwajalein. On Kwajalein. Kwajalein. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the message when you were on duty, then you told... I told the commanding officer immediately that we're, we've got to make ready for these, for these guys. See, this, this is when the officers took over, and we were able to send this home, but you cut off on Bonica. That was in the Russells. But the officers took over for all the enlisted men. The beer song? Yeah. And were you providing the music? Yeah, I was part of the music. Yeah. All the time. 
Maybe I'd have copied this also if I could. I got all these little notes of I Marcello played his famous accordion <laughs> right up in there. Private Roberts had a golden baritone voice. Yeah, that was him. He sang beautifully. Who you said one of the gentlemen had a voice that rivals Sinatra. Yeah, that that was the guy that uh, and that other oh. that was a different guy. So this um, this weekly series with the patients, this what, where was this on Kwajalein or or Benica? I, it could, it could have been, been one of the two, out. yeah, or both because I'd done it there too. But this was little Martha Tilton, and so was this your idea to do this? Pardon? Was it your idea to do? No, that? we had a little paper. Okay. And, uh, he he put that out, you know. Martha Tilton. Yeah, well, June Brunner there. I don't know if you want to, that's one of the other things that we're putting. This is a Three Deuces Station Hospital yeah. newsletter. That's right. Volume 1, number 3. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel D.S. Curry. That was our commanding officer. He was a good guy. There's a little note. This was on when we were back in uh, second paragraph down. That was at Fredericksburg, Virginia. It reads. Could you read there what it's? Could you read the second paragraph? It says, uh, "Well, well, we always knew T five. I was a T five. I was a corporal, and Ray Marchetta was a good entertainer." But now he has turned professional, stage director, and formed a stage company, giving those popular USO shows in on Wednesday evenings. Other members of the company were Tardenti and Bill Bruss. This Bill Bruss danced with Bojangles. Wow. How do you like that? Yeah. When he was a kid. Like Shirley Temple danced with Bojangles, so did Bill. But that this is that tells you I, that's when I was the director of the show. Yeah. But there, there's. These are all different guys from. Another picture of Jack Benny all alone. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, this is where T three. If you were T three or better, you could get a pass like that. So that's when I was in Hawaii. That pass, and I could go off the base any time. You were a trustee, you know. Yeah, this is the 29th of November, 1945. So yeah, yeah. when we were coming home. Yeah. yeah. We went horseback riding up at Diamond Head, and oh boy, uh, I had uh, a problem with hemorrhoids. Mustaches. Mine looked like a. Like an old toothbrush, <laughs> they said. Sister.
Well, this is our farewell summer at Donna's Diner in Hawaii. That was our, that's before they split our outfit up and we were all in our special ways then. Farewell supper. Yeah. Donna's Dining Room. Yeah, that was over on King Street in Hawaii. It's about halfway in between Honolulu and, and thing. This was when I made T3. The good captain gave me some nice words. Yeah. First of November, 1945. Yeah. Well, Mr. Marchette, I want to thank you for a uh, oh, enlightening and generous interview. You know what? And you've documented it with the... I, I, I remember it really. I forgot so much. You remember so much. It's amazing. Really, yeah. yeah. So it's going to be luckier than going to be make, the average beer. It's going to make a great, uh, a great interview. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go and um, uh, scan these so we can. Okay. Uh, it'll help me with the preparation of the interview. And I want to thank you very much hey, for listen, coming. My pleasure. Yeah. Listen, I, you know, we go through life and you don't know what you really. There's so many times that you'd like to talk about this and you never do. Yeah. I, this is more than I've opened up to anyone. Uh, you know, you've. Do you remember uh, the gentleman that survived Torpedo Squadron 8 when they went into Midway? Ensign George Gay. Do you recall that? I just know the book. name. I, yeah, I've, George I've, Gay. I've never he was seen. one guy out of the entire squadron lived. That was George Gay. I met him. He was my, one, when I was president of Navy League, why we had him as our guest speaker. He and I, we drank until 2 o'clock in the morning, BSing one another. We had a great time together. Ray, I've got the book autographed at home. Yeah. Ray, you didn't mention president of the Navy League. Yes. What, what, uh... Well, I was president of Navy League. I started out, I'd done the rodeo three years in a row. And they wanted me to be a president. I could say most of the time the presidents of Navy League were bank presidents, attorneys. There's Ray Marchetta snuck in there. <laughs> he was the super construction superintendent, and I was the commanding. I was the uh, president of it. And I've got I've got plaques and things at home. I didn't bring none of that along. Yeah. That's civilian life, you know. Yeah. Afterward. Afterward. But I've got all of that at home, too. I had one wall, my ego wall, so to speak. And I have all these things from when John Eskew was, you know, was the commanding officer over there. Uh, my wife's nephew uh, is a fellow by the name of uh, Kurt Ames, who's Colonel, full Colonel Ames. He was commanding officer of, of MAG-48. Just... Uh, well, probably eight, nine years ago. But he, that's 13, that takes in 13 states, you know. Commanding officer of, of MAG-48. He lived up at uh, Great Lakes at that time frame. He had built it up there. And he owns a park. He owns a, uh, a brewery now, you know, where he, one of these mini breweries. Oh, craft where they craft. Beers, yeah. Well, up in McHenry. They're very popular. Yeah. And his, uh, it's called, it was something else. It was Mickey. And now it's uh, Chain of Lakes Brewery. But that belongs to him. And he's got entertainment up there. They're not open every day of the week, but they're open quite a yeah. bit. They had a big shindig, you know, for yeah. he, veterans, you know, and these oh, Marines, they do it. The big birthday ball and you name it, you know. Ray, i got to ask you, do you still play the accordion? No, I, my hands, I played the organ. I went from the accordion to the organ. I've still got the big Hammond at home. I enjoy it. I sit there with one note or something. I can't play like I did. I sit there and cry. <laughs> I don't have the ability anymore, you know. Because I could, I could play anything. If I knew the song, I could play it. You know, knew the melody. That's an advantage. I never realized what an advantage that was. Uh, until people start telling me, how in the hell do you do that? Yeah. It's just the way, you know, I, 
I was blessed with a good good ear instead of a tin one, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it all. That's so like I say, I've had a wonderful life, my friend. I don't have many regrets, you know. Or well, I, I, I thank you very much for, for coming in today and for giving us this yeah. generous interview, and I look forward to preparing it for okay. your uh, consideration and right. approval. Thanks, Ray. Thanks my very pleasure. much. Thank you, you so much for right. having me.